welcome. Now we're on. Okay. All right. Welcome to Compass. This is a high day whenever we have special guests, but especially when a new child of Jesus is being dedicated for his life, for the rest of his life, and parents and grandparents and family. And just this is so exciting. So we're just so excited for Caden and for Ashton and Ashton and uh, for this great day. Last night was amazing. We had the most wonderful time out here at the bonfire. It went so well. The music, the fellowship, we had about, we had over 70, I think, 85 or something like that. And it was, it was so much fun. It was perfect, and the kids played, and Dave gave a wonderful little talk for us. And um, I'm just thankful for everybody that had part in it. And I hope we do it often because it's a perfect spot. Everybody, this is a miracle. This whole facility, it can only be used, say one word, it's a miracle. And how God led us to this place through Jonathan and through other people, it's amazing. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't gone over since the very beginning and looked at our children's facility, our youth building over there, under the leadership of James and many others, it has transformed. It is amazing. It, smells good. it even smells good. I know. And just think about it, everybody. We went from no sink in our facility to two kitchens. We went from one bathroom to more than we want to clean. <laughs> it is just amazing. I mean, I just get pricklies all over me thinking about what we have and the opportunities now, the responsibility and the awesomeness of now listening to what God wants us to do. And that's kind of where I want to go this morning is um, I had to, I've been, I, I struggle with prayer just because is it effective? Am I, you know, do I do it enough? Do I, you know, and just getting closer and closer and closer to a relationship to Jesus as a friend and, and being able to talk to God through Jesus and, and, and just be honest and authentic. And I've really worked on that. But one of the most important things that I'm really experiencing in my life right now, and I just want to share, is, again, living from a life of gratitude. I think it is the key to everything. And God asks us to pray for that. He, all through Scripture, he talks about being grateful, coming with a grateful heart. And some of us are thinking, well, what do I have to be grateful for? Well, so-and-so's got it better. And you know what? They probably do. That's life. They probably do. Always somebody that's got it better and somebody that's got it worse. But you know what? This, you are alive. What a blessing. You are here this morning with every opportunity God wants to give you. And I just think it's so amazing. And I have to read this because I re I'm rereading Yancey's book on prayer. And it's interesting how when you reread books, how it just hits you totally differently. And it says, it starts out with life is a gift. And he said, I heard a stirring speech by a young man called David Rothenberg. And he had undergone more than 60 surgeries. And at six years old, he suffered third degree burns over 90% of his body when his father gave him a sleeping pill, poured kerosene on him, and set him on fire. What gives you the courage to keep going, he was asked. And David replied, I am alive, I am alive, I am alive. I didn't miss out on living, and that is good enough for me. Is that not amazing? And now we know that health statistics show us that living from a heart of gratitude even prolongs life it can give you it can change your heart it can give you it can give you a longer life and a healthier life so today as you come to worship you may be thinking oh man i i just everything's just going wrong and i don't think my prayers are being answered or you may be living on a mountain high right now because faith moves mountains of guilt and of grief but as you think and you worship and you listen to the songs today, I want you to think of one thing. I 
am alive. And God has so many opportunities for me to be a blessing and live for the utmost of his highest. And what more to be thankful for. So let's bow our heads and pray as we begin this service on this high day. Our Father God, we are alive because of you. You have continued to give us life. And now we want to take the responsibility of being available, of listening to you and what we can do to be your hands, your feet, your voice, your person as we continue to live and we live for you. Thank you. Today we choose joy. And what a blessing to be a part of this family, to be a part of this miracle, and to wait with anxious expectations about your plans for this place and for each of our lives. Be with our worship today as we praise you. Amen. People come together, strangers, neighbors, our blood is one. Children of generations, of every nation, of kingdom come. So don't let your heart be trouble hold your head up high don't fear no evil fix your eyes on this one truth god is madly in love with you so take courage hold on be strong remember where our help comes from Whoa. Good grace, good God, 
His name is Jesus. Swing wide, all you heavens. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All His children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus.
is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. Soldiers watched in vain Was borrowed for three days His body there would not remain Our God has robbed the grave Our God has robbed the grave Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. By your Spirit I will rise. From the ashes of defeat, the resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. resurrecting me Love 
will you bow your heads with, for prayer? Dear God, we come to you today and want to thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you freely and not have to worry about anyone else except for just being in your presence and focusing on you. Even though this whole mask thing isn't fun, it's definitely worth it to be able to come worship and praise you. And I just ask that you will have, um, be with the baby dedication and help that all to go well. And um, please be with the speaker and help his, your words to speak through him. And help us all to just feel you here and to have open hearts and open minds to what you have to say. And we love you and pray in your son's name. Amen. kids that would like a children's story this morning? If so, come up and pick a dot and have a seat on it. Good. Hi there. I have a story to read to you written by my cousin and it's called the adventures of George and Princess Frezzy and they're human it's kind of a long story so I'm gonna read some and I'm gonna tell some and you'll notice when I read a part it's a rhyming part and you'll hear you'll hear some rhyming words well, this story is about two little birds that lived on top of a tall, tall house in the gutter. And you know, the gutter is that kind of that pipe that goes along the roof and it catches the water when it rains on top of the roof. Then the water goes down the water spout and down underneath the ground. Well, that's where they lived. And one day, George told Frizzy, I am bored. I want to fly away. No, said Frizzy, you cannot fly. You have no feathers. You must have feathers to fly. Black clouds rolled in, and soon the wind began to blow, and the rain began to fall, and George liked it. But Frizzy didn't. She did not like to be cold or wet. Once again, George stood on the side of his nest. I want to fly. No, said Frizzy. You do not have enough feathers to fly. I have enough for me, said George. And without any further words, with a flitter and a flutter, George began lifting to lift off the gutter. And without enough feathers, he dropped, 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 and went wee all the way down the rain spout to a little dark tunnel under the ground. You think he's in trouble? Well, thunk and plunk, and there he was in the dark. He looked around. He couldn't see anything or anybody, and he was beginning to feel hungry. Well, outside that pipe was a human watering her flowers. And she stopped, and she listened, and guess what? She heard George's little chirps and cries. And she took a little shovel and she scraped back the dirt and there was little George. She scooped him up and George was so relieved. She put him in a safe bird cage, made a bed for him out of a towel, gave him clean water to drink and some fruit 
and he had his first car ride. She was off to work, and she took George with her because she was going to make sure that he had plenty of food and water all day long. Well, back in the nest, Frizzy couldn't rest. She wanted to be brave, and she wanted to slide fast. Could she be like George? Well, she had to see, so she flittered and she fluttered, and down, down, down she went through the rain pipe, the water spout. And about that time, the human was standing in her house, and she thought, should I go and check to see if there's another bird outside? Sure enough, the human was right. Another bird had fallen from flight. Without enough feathers to set her free, the human would be the one to get them back to the trees. So there she is, providing water. Ladder. As we got bigger and our feathers grew, it didn't take long before the human knew it wouldn't be much longer before it was time to be released to the trees. Would the outdoors be kind? One day our human put our cage outdoors. The day was warm. The sun was bright. The birds were singing. There was nothing to fright. And there's the cage sitting outside, and all was good until out of the woods came a giant brown hawk. And Georgie and Frizzy began to squawk, and the human heard their cries. And out the door she ran, yelling and screaming, telling that hawk to leave her friends alone scared the hawk and he fell to the ground and off he flew and Frizzy and Georgie were nice safe and sound. As the days went by Georgie got grumpy. He knew that the real world out there would be rough but he wanted to be free and he wanted to fly. Not Frizzy. She liked her nice, safe, warm cage. The day had come, the sun was bright, our human was releasing us. It had to be right. We were born to be free and live in the trees. Our human was torn. What would our fate be? So she opened the door. George was in hand, a kiss on his head. And his journey began. George flew. He was finally of age. He was so happy. He had waited so long. But Frizzy wasn't sure where she belonged. With a flitter and a flutter, just like before, she followed George. And once in the trees, Frizzy didn't, couldn't keep up. George darted here and there, and she just couldn't keep up with him. The wind was blowing, and the branches were f going back and forth. And Frizzy thought, when I was on my little stick in my cage, my stick didn't move like this. And then she thought of her warm bath her teacup of water and that good fruit and her loving human. And she realized it was getting dark and she was going to have to spend the night in the trees. Here she is thinking about her fruit platter, her water. And then the next morning, she made a break for it. She couldn't see her human, and she couldn't see an opening to the human's house. But she saw a neighbor. Would he help her? 
She flew into the garage with a bumpy landing, and she was hoping that Mr. Mark wouldn't be grumpy. Would he help her get back to her human? Of course he would. He ran to get her human, you see. The way it all happened was pure destiny. Her human was as happy as can be. She couldn't imagine a night in the trees, a warm bath, a fruit platter, and a bucket of worms. Mmm. But Frizzy had learned that she didn't have to be like George. She could be Frizzy. And she knew that we're all God's children, great and small. I pray for a hand to save us all when we fall. Take the time every day to be there for others, no matter what life throws our way. You know, in God's word, he said, be kind one to another. I see lots of kind faces here, and you can go back to your seats. Good morning. It sure is a pleasure to be here today. Sorry, I'm just going to arrange some cables. Yeah, because we have some very important guests, Ashton and Ashton. Do you want to come and join me? <clears throat> what a pleasure. What a pleasure. When Ashton asked me uh, a week or two ago, I, uh, I got quite emotional about it having the privilege of, of dedicating little Caden. Every child is a gift from God to be a blessing to each one of us. And it is an absolute pleasure to be able to participate in this gift, this gift that has been given to the two of you. I, um, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> I apologize for that. And not only is it a gift, but if you think about it, we're actually given the opportunity to participate with God in creation. This little one came from the two of you. You were part of his creation. And there's responsibility that comes along with that creation. One of the things that I'm sure you begin to discover this already is your perspective and your idea about God starts changing. I think you can only understand the love of God when you have your own child. How God can be to so tolerant of us when we have our own children and we see a lot of things that we don't always like and we but we are so tolerant of that child. And not only the tolerance of, and love of the child, but also the grace that goes along with it. And I can promise you, if you're good parents, and I know you will be good parents, he's gonna disappoint you. He's gonna do things that you will not be happy with. But being in the image of God you will have the opportunity to show grace. It's an incredible experience. And that's your responsibility. Ashton Fisher, your role is so important. 
I cannot tell you how important it is. One day, as he gets older, you are going to be his hero. He's going to look up to you, and the view that he has of you, and this is, don't just feel to take this pressure, is the view that he will have of God. The way you behave, the way that you be, treat Ashton, that's the way he will view God. And if you're kind and generous, gentle, that's the God that he will see. Ashton Tate, mom. I think the most difficult job in the world, nothing more difficult than that, and the most responsible job in the world. And one day, I can assure you, and it's not going to be too far from now, you'll want to disown that name of mommy. You won't even be able to go to the bathroom and you'll have this little, little mommy, mommy, mommy. Am I, am I correcting that and saying, I am not mommy, go away. You will always, always, always be important to him. Always be important to him. Family, and I'm so glad to see so many people here with their, all their masks on. Your roles are so important. You are the, you, your role is here to take care of these two people as a parent, as grandparents and great-grandparents, and uncles and aunts and other relatives. Support and take care of him. And as a church, we have a very important role, and I, and I don't have to get very preachy about this because I've already seen it in, the, in our community, in our fellowship over here. They will need your support. They will need your time. And sometimes they'll probably even need your shoulder. The frustrations, and as parents that I'm sure that I'm, a lot of you understand this, there's a lot of frustrations that go along with with being a parent. And if each one of you makes yourself available to them, their lives will be that much easier. Proverbs 22 verse 6, well-known text. Train up a child in the way they should go, and they shall not depart from it. Unfortunately, that text is often misinterpreted. Often we think of it as the discipline that is needed to raise a child. And even though discipline is very important, and I cannot stress that enough, discipline is vitally important on raise, raising up a child. But that text actually means helping that child discover their gifts and their talents. Train up the child in the way they should go. In other words, train, find, help them find their gifts, the important things that they are needed. So, and the, if you find Caden's gift, and this is probably the most important role that you will have as far as parents are concerned, find his gifts, help him to love God and show God's love to him is the most important thing that you need to do for this child. Nothing more important than that. So family, I would like all the family to stand um, as we pray. And I'm going to take a little Caden here. And <coughs> hey, little boy. Man, he's chunky. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Let us bow our heads. God, we are so thankful for this gift, for this blessing, for this child. And at this time, we hand him over to you. We hand over Ashton and Ashton. We want them 
to follow your lead so that this boy will be grow up to be a servant of yours. And I pray, Lord, that you'll be with each member of this family and families. Help them to take their role seriously. Help them and give them strength to show love to this little boy, that they may be Jesus to them. And I pray, Lord, that you'll be with our congregation, our community of believers. May we be aware of opportunities and may we open up our lives that we can be servants of yours. I pray that you bless Caden, bless his life. He has only one life to live and we don't want to squander that life. I pray this in the loving name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who died that Caden can have eternal life. I pray in your loving name. Amen. Thank you very much. I've got, this, I've got some certificates over here. That one. Just give it to you. I can I'll make two copies of it. And yeah. you can take that. And, okay, thank you. I don't think I've been so nervous in such a long time. That was, that was more nerves wracking to me than standing up here to speak. I don't know why. Uh, it, it's just, it's such, a it's such a pleasure. The Karoo is a vast arid area of, of South Africa. It's just south of the Kalahari Desert and it covers a large portion of the country. It's, uh, if you've been to Arizona, very similar to Arizona as far as the, uh, the climate and topology is concerned. And on the eastern side of the Karoo is a town by the name of Cradock. And in Cradock, there's a Dutch Reformed church where my grandmother was christened about 120 years ago. A few years ago, on one of our trips to South Africa, I, was, um, I wanted to go to Cradock. I have this thing about churches, but I specifically wanted to go to this church because that is where my grandmother was, was christened. And the christening itself wasn't so important because I believe in adult uh, baptism. But I was trying to understand where my grandmother came from. We found this church and it's actually a smaller replica of St. Martin's in the field in, in Trafalgar Square in London, if you know where St. Martin's is, and they make a lot of music, so if you enjoy classical music, you probably heard some of their music. Beautiful, absolutely gorgeous church. It's, it's fairly large, even though it's a, it's, it's a smaller version, it still holds about a thousand people. And we walked into this, into this, uh, into this church. We found somebody that, the, the caretaker was there, it was during, the, was during the week, and he let us in through the back door, and we came through the vestry, and we walked into, into the main, what they call the sanctuary. And it was a beautiful, bright day, and all the, the, the stained glass windows, which the sun was coming through, and it was absolutely gorgeous. The ceiling and the walls are white, and all the pews are a dark stinkwood. It's a hard wood found in South Africa. Absolutely gorgeous. And then <clears throat> if you turned around, 
the Dutch Reformed Church has those high pulpits about 10 feet above so that you look down upon your congregation. All beautiful wood ingrained. I don't think that church could be afforded to be built in today's world. It'll be far too expensive. And I actually went up on top at the pulpit and I looked down in, and right in front of the pulpit is, <clears throat> they call it a baptismal font, even though it's not the way we understand a baptismal font, but it's, it's on a pedestal. It was about four feet high. Um, it was pure marble. And then inside the marble was, was a bowl made of pure silver. And that's where they, they poured the water and they took the water and they sprinkled on the, on the, the child's forehead. The Dutch Reformed Church sprinkles uh, water on the child when they baptize them or chris uh, christen them. It's quite interesting when you go into a church like that, just the magnificence of that church. How quiet you get. We couldn't speak loud. We had a whisper. Even though it was just Cheryl and I and my brother, three of us in this church, there's a, there's a, there's, it just demands that you, that you be quiet. And that's really our topic for today, the power of quiet in a world of noise. But then I looked down at that, at that uh, font, baptismal font, and I thought to myself, that's where my grandmother was christened in 1901. And I reflected on, on her, and I often, ref, I often ref, reflect on that particular grandmother. This is my mother's, mother's her name was Anna Sophia Portgeta. Her friends call her Anne. We knew her as Oma. Oma was very important to us. She wasn't a very big lady. She was probably five foot two, five foot three. She didn't speak much. She was an introvert, a very strong introvert. And she didn't have much to say. I'm sure she did, but she never let it out. But other than my parents, there was probably no one else who had as much influence on my life as that woman. She never told me that she loved me. I don't ever recall her saying that but I never doubted it. She had more influence of her children and her grandchildren than anybody else had over those same people. And Cheryl was asking me the other day, I was talking about this and I was getting emotional again with her. I'm all emotional now. Um, <clears throat> And she said to me, how, how could she be such an influence when she was such a quiet person? And my response was very quick. I didn't even have to think about it because she was always present. She was always there. She died in 1977, so I was 22 years old when, when she died, and I, I was fortunate enough to be at her bedside um, for a few days leading up to her death. She died of, of cancer of the liver, if I remember correctly. 
and she had suffered for a long time, a very long time. She was this frail lady and, and her belly had extended tremendously. And uh, they, they were keeping her comfortable. <clears throat> and her arms and her legs were just nothing, little sticks. And I remember helping her drink water, and uh, she drank out a little styrofoam cup, and we actually had to cut the straw down several times because with a longer straw, she didn't have enough strength to be able to drink out of the, the full length of the straw. Spent hours at her bedside, just holding her hand, not saying a word, just like old days, hadn't changed. She. Uh, <clears throat> The evening she died, it was quite amazing how this happens. Um, three of her four, she, at that stage she had four living children. Three of them were there and my, the fourth one had to come down from <clears throat> what was then Rhodesia, which is now Harare in, in Zimbabwe. And he arrived that afternoon and the four of them were in the room when she died. She waited for for him to arrive. And I was out with friends <clears throat> and I came home and I said, how's Oma? And they said, she died. I'll never forget that piece. I think a lot of you understand what I'm saying. There's a peace that comes from after a person has suffered for a long time and they move on and there's no more suffering. I was reading this week, I was reading just a very short book but there was a profound statement in that book. And it really brought together the, 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 the dedication and what our topic is today. Your life, and Ashton and Ashton, your life has an unknown expiration date. It's gonna to come to an end. But the influence that you have on others will not go away. There's no expiration on the influence. And I was thinking about my grandmother, how that quiet influence that she had on, on her children and then on us as grandchildren, and she didn't know any of her great-grandchildren, but now I see it going on to her great-great-grandchildren. That quiet influence is not dying, it continues. It absolutely continues, no expiration. And the influence could be good or it could be bad. And it's our responsibility to make sure that it's a positive influence. It's so interesting that silence or the presence of God can be found at both ends of life, at the beginning of life 
and at the end of life. I've just told you about my grandmother. I had a similar experience with my father. He died in, in 2012. There was many of us of our family in, in, in a room when he, when he passed away. And I remember so clearly when he took his final breath and then that peace and that quiet. And you feel the presence of God. You know God is there. If you ever doubt the presence of God, that's the time to experience it. But also on the beginning of life, uh, fortunate enough to be with, with uh, Ashley with the first one, second one, we weren't allowed to be there, but I wish we could have been there, but, and with Heather. When you go through all this, uh, I call it trauma, but it's probably not trauma, but the, the going through the, the giving birth to this child and, and all the pain that you, that you, well, for me, I was watching. I, I wasn't experiencing it, but I was experienced from a, from a distance. <clears throat> and then when that child is born, and that child is given to the mother, and that child is put onto the breast, and there's a quietness in the room, and you hear that suckling of that influence for the first time, of that child, that infant for the first time. You feel that presence. Unfortunately, we live in an extremely busy world and we don't experience silence and quietness much anymore. And it's very, very unfortunate because we need it. We need it really badly. Silence is not just a lack of noise. It's an empty space for your mind to recover clarity and to protect you from mental noise. So if you're in a chaotic situation and you have no idea where to go and what to do, probably the best thing that you can do is walk away, find a quiet place, and be quiet. Don't even think about the issues that you're dealing with. Be quiet. Your mind is like a canvas. It is full of noise, it's full of graffiti. Stuff has been thrown at, at your mind and your soul all day long. It's just bombarded, bombarded, bombarded. Silence enables that mind and your soul to be cleansed the whiteboard to be erased and so that just the white shows. And this gives God an opportunity to start painting his ideas and his thoughts and his ways. And then he might even hand the brush to you and say, continue painting that picture of your life. Silence is not isolation. Busyness detaches us from reality. We need to take distance and reflect. A Chinese philosopher said, just remain in the center watching and then forget that you are there. If you can get to the place that you don't realize that you are there, that you are actually watching and reflecting and getting beyond chaos that's in our life. Silence is not about the absence of sounds. 
it invites the presence of God. Psalms 20, 46 verse 10. And this is a well-known verse. Be still and know I am God. So this is often, we often think of this be still to be silent. But really, <clears throat> if you go back to the original language of this be still, this is the way it can be equated. Uh, I don't know if you ever try to change a little uh, hyperactive little boy or little girl, uh, and they're kicking their legs, and you're trying to get pants on their legs, and they're just going, going absolutely crazy, and you're trying to, and eventually say to them, be still, be still. That is what we do with God. We are so busy doing our hyperactive things that we don't allow him to dress us. We don't allow him to take control of our lives. That silence and stillness is vital for our Christian growth, for our understanding of God and the way we are. When I was in college, I used to sing in, in the choir, and uh, <clears throat> of all the songs that I can remember, and, and it was my favorite and favorite to this day, was the, what's the song before you sing, bef when everybody's in their robes and you stand up there and the Lord is in his holy temple? The Lord is in his holy temple. I'm not going to sing it. And of course, we misinterpret that because we, we, we had this understanding that God was coming into this, the physical building to come meet with us. Unfortunately, we have that understanding. That the truth is, in the New Testament, God sent his spirit to indwell within us. So that when we come together, God's presence is here because his presence is in each one of us. And this is such an appropriate place for us to just contemplate about God. Because together we are having church. We are worshiping God in silence. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Let all the earth keep silent before him. So, one of the things Megan's trying to drum into our heads is to try and give some practical ways of how we can learn to be, to experience the silence and the silence in front of God. And I think uh, last week, if you were here, uh, Megan gave us some, uh, a, some good hints as to one of, the th one of the most common ways we can do in the modern world, and that is to put electronic devices Aside, and I'm not going to go into that because she got it. She got into that. Um, put those phones away sometime. When you go to bed at night, leave your phone in a different room. I'm not going to go into it. You know, we, we had a series on, on uh, about a year ago, actually, uh, a little less than a year ago on, on the Sabbath. And I believe that this is one of the most important things that we can do on Sabbath, is to be silent. Come into God's presence. Be aware of him. I, um, one of the things I, I really enjoy, and I really enjoy this, is when I prepare for these talks, these teachings, uh, I often wake up at night and it's usually about two, 2 or 3 o'clock at night. And that's the time 
when I spent most of my time lying in bed prepping because I can focus on what God is trying to tell me. And you, if you have those opportunities waking up in the middle of the night, use them. Trying to get away from the stresses. Trying, it's easy to go and think about, about the stressful things in life. Try and distract and break that thinking and move towards thinking about God. And then I came across a very practical experience, and this is one thing that I think would be very, very helpful for for all of us. Five, 10, 15 minute rule. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15. So for five minutes, read something. Something spiritual, something from the Bible. And then for 10 minutes, write down what you read and thought you read and your thoughts about what you read. And then for 15 minutes, just think about it. And as time goes long, we probably can extend that time period. You find out that, uh, that uh, five minutes is long, not long enough to read, but you can extend each one of those. Read, write, and think. And just double the time for each one of them. Well, not double, five, 10, and 15 minutes. Keep those proportions. It's a practical way of experiencing God. A practical way of a busy world to try and get back to who God is. I know I've told the story before, but I have to tell it again. Uh, 2016, uh, the family and I went to, we did a trip through Botswana, Namibia, some uh, Zimbabwe and back to South Africa. And um, one of the places we went to was in the Kalahari Desert, there's this place called the Mahadikhari Pan. The Mahadikhari Pan stretches, when you're on it, it's just a flat plain. And when you're on it, you can see all the way to the horizon. It's almost like the salt flats of, of Utah. And during the rainy season, it actually there's two to three feet of water over there, and there's some islands that appear on some of the, ra- the raised land. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's where the pelicans and other birds, mainly pelicans, uh, come in, and flamingos as well, come and nest. It's a safe area for them to nest and have their little ones. And then when the water goes down after the rainy season, which is usually at the beginning of summer, uh, they can migrate back to, to the main, where the, the forested areas or the grasslands. And we were at a place called Kubu Island, and, it's, and when we were there, it didn't look like an island because it was dry. And uh, <clears throat> we were only going to spend one night there, and I said, I'm going to get out onto the, onto the Makhari Khari, and Ashley decided that she was going to go with me. And uh, in fact, just very recently, we were talking about this and, I, and we were saying, what is our favorite part of that particular trip? And both Ashley and I agreed that that was the absolute favorite thing that we did. So we rose at about 5 a.m. And because the, because the Makhari Khari is, it's, uh, it's north of the tropical, tropical Capricorn, so it's not too far from the equator, so your sunsets and your sunrises are very short. You don't have a, a long sunrise or sunset. They, it's on and off pretty, pretty quick. So you, you have to get out there. So when we went out at, at 5 o'clock at night, it was absolutely pitch, pitch dark. We were probably close. We were probably 100, maybe 150 miles from the closest village. There was no unnatural light, whether it was a fire or electricity, it was absolutely nothing else. And when you looked up into the skies, you just saw this, this and, it's, and it's desert area, so it's low humidity, so the clarity is so magnificent. You looked up into the skies and, and the stars 
were just so bright and so beautiful. It's, it's, so, it's so difficult to, to, ex, to ex, even explain that. And as we walked onto the Mahadi uh, Hadi, onto the, the pen itself, as we took a step, it was so quiet because there was absolutely no noise. You could actually hear the water, the water had, was still just below the surface of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the pan. And as you raised your foot, you could actually hear the, 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 the sand come up. You could actually just, just which you would never hear in, in normal. And when we sat down, you could actually hear your heartbeat very noticeably. That is the only noise you heard and your breathing. No light, no sound. Sounds horrible. One of the best experiences of my life. A memorable experience. And a moment where you feel God's presence in a magnificent way. You look up there and you realize there has to be a creator. There has to be a bigger being to be able to create that. I know not everybody has the opportunity to have those type of experiences. But you need to try and you need to f find the time to find quietness so that you can experience God. Patience was amazing, waiting while my heart was wandering. Your kindness is surprising as I stumble home, you'll run to me. I'm welcome with rejoicing, wrapped in the of royalty and now I'm overflowing singing of the love I have received I love you Lord I love you Lord 
Quote from uh, T.S. Eliot. Where shall, the, where shall the word be found? Where will the word resound? Not here. There is not enough silence. Let's bow our heads. Father, we know that we, we don't make time for you. We know that life is busy and we don't make you a priority. And I pray, Lord, that you'll forgive us for that. I pray that you'll help us to find the time to be silent, to make our minds and our souls a canvas that is clean so that you can work your beautiful art in it, so that you can plan your life, our lives, so that you can work within us. And we want to be partners with you, Lord. Help us. I pray in your loving name. Amen.